one night. We sat together. We watched little Ben Burns and Stickleton. You remember that? You're not Rex. No, Speed. I'm sorry, but your brother is dead. Every once in a while, something will come around that won't be respected at the time of its release. Whether it's a piece of art, an individual, sometimes you don't see the beauty in an artist or a piece of art until it's gone. Usually the main example when it comes to this I see is musical artists and their albums, but like I said, it doesn't apply to just that. This often happens with movies, as a lot of the times these are boundary pushing pieces of work that shape the future generations of pop culture. In recent years, there hasn't been too much of that. There's been a lot of going back to tradition, which has worked, but when's the last time a quote unquote modern day blockbuster went out there and tried to make something new. Flip the entire idea of what a blockbuster is on its head. Well, since you're asking me, I'll give you this. Your son seems to be interested in only one thing. All he talks about, all he seems capable of thinking about, is automobile racing. Released on April 26, 2008, Speed Racer has gone on to be, well, a movie. While well, finally getting the respect it deserves as a cult classic, at the time of its release, Speed Racer was not well received at all, not even by general audiences. Sitting at a 41% tomato meter score and a 60% audience score, which isn't horrible but still not great, it clearly was not a hit, and if you look at the box office numbers, that will go ahead and reaffirm it for you. The worldwide box office total for Speed Racer only came in at $93.9 million dollars USD. Yes, you heard me right, that was the worldwide total, not even domestic. Calling this a flop would be kind of an understatement. But why did this flop? And I'm sure some of you might be asking, what the hell even is Speed Racer? Well, today we're going to be talking about that. Why did this movie not succeed? But most importantly, what makes this one of the most culturally important, riskiest, and greatest movies of recent memory? We're going to be talking about all of that today. This is why Speed Racer is a forgotten matter. Masterpiece. <laughs> In order to talk about Speed Racer the movie, it's kind of necessary for you to talk about the Speed Racer anime from back in the 1960s. In 1967, the Speed Racer anime was brought over to America. Not only was it one of the first Japanese animations to be taken seriously over here and go somewhat mainstream, but it was also revolutionary in terms of its use of color. Stuff like the original Astro Boy anime were in black and white. For the time, this was kind of revolutionary stuff, even if it hasn't aged the best. He's gone over that cliff! Now say what you want about it aging, I think this is absolutely hilarious, and I still find a lot of enjoyment going back to watch. Obviously dubbing something that was originally used in Japan, they tried to have the lip sync up to the actual voice acting, which had the lines come off very quickly. It made for dialogue that didn't come off natural at all. This is no time to act like a girl, Trixie. Okay. But not just that, the show was also known for its extreme violence. Giant car crashes, deaths, guns. The show wasn't afraid to hold back. And maybe that's why it caught on with kids, with a lot of shows around that time being very censored. The thing is though, with Speed Racer, this original run was really its only run. There was never more seasons produced, this was it. So going into the 1970s and 80s, the franchise kind of fizzled out. But with a little American based company called Speed Racer Enterprises, there was an initiative to bring Speed Racer back to America in a prominent way, which included a Speed Racer movie that was really just repackaged episodes put in theaters, merchandise, and reruns on Cartoon Network and MTV, where specifically MTV, it really popped off with older audiences, bringing back that nostalgia factor. Even though I'm only from 2002, I remember one of my most vivid memories as a kid was seeing that Speed Racer poster in the back of Friends, that was so cool. But with this somewhat resurgence of popularity in Speed Racer, interest in making an actual movie grew. But don't get me wrong, it wasn't easy. Back in the 90s, Speed Racer had quite the tumultuous time getting into live action. There were always plans to make a Speed Racer movie with pretty big names attached, but literally all of them fell through. Back in 1992, Warner Brothers acquired the rights to the Speed Racer property, as there were always plans to make a live action adaptation of the anime. Around 1995, Johnny Depp was actually cast in the role of Speed Racer, with production being slated to begin later that October. But Depp requested time off for personal reasons, so that kind of delayed the process.
project. Due to this wait, their director, Julian Temple, left the project and Dub followed. Around two years down the line in 1997, Alfonso Caron of all people was attached as the director. Imagine that. With way too many names than necessary being attached to write the script, such as Mark Levin, Jennifer Flackett, Patrick Reed Johnson, and yes, J.J. freaking Abrams. What a lineup of people they had attached to this thing at one point. But this also bled over into the early 2000s, where Speed Racer's resurgence in popularity, if you can even really call it that, was starting to fizzle out hard. In September of 2000, Warner Brothers hired Hype Williams to helm the project. A few screenwriters were attached, but production never got underway, so both the screenwriters and Hype Williams detached from the project once again. And then four years later, Vince Vaughn of all people spearheaded a revival of the project. He would be playing Racer X himself, as well as executive producing, but Warner Brothers never wanted to put the film in active production, so Vaughn was eventually detached again. I feel like a Speed Racer movie could have happened in the 90s if Depp just simply didn't request that time off, as plans for production were very close, but it seems like after that point, Warner had no interest in making another project, until 2006 rolled around. Around the early 2000s, Warner Brothers had a couple of hits on their hands, specifically the Matrix franchise and V for Vendetta. While some of the Matrix sequels weren't the best received, the original Matrix movie is considered one of the most innovative and boundary-pushing blockbusters of all time. Every installment racked up a bunch of money for the studio, and V for Vendetta was a little cherry on top of the Matrix Sunday, as that film also had a good critical reception and made a decent amount of money for what it was. But who made these movies exactly? Those are the Wachowski sisters, a powerhouse duo of, well, sisters, who are proving to be very successful for Warner. To further their careers and to help them reach a broader audience, i.e. not making rated R movies, the idea of making a family film, more specifically a Speed Racer movie, was brought up. And with the Wachowskis being fans of the original anime, their boundary pushing work and success at the box office, needless to say, Warner Brothers found their directors. Not only would they be the directors of this film, but they also wrote the movie as well. This was their full vision. Warner Brothers let them make whatever they wanted to make. They had an incredible unique vision that would not only pay respects to the source material, but push beyond where it ever could have gone before. With Shia LaBeouf, Zac Efron, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt up for the role, Emile Hirsch eventually landed the part. From there, it was off. Speed Racer was finally happening. And then on May 9th, 2008, Speed Racer officially hit theaters. And if you are at all familiar with the story, you know exactly how this thing went. 2008 was one of the most interesting years for movies in history. In 2008, the first movie in a series of films that would go on to become the biggest franchise in movie history was released, that being Iron Man. Not just that, but one of the greatest comic book movies, but heck, one of the greatest movies of all time also released, that being The Dark Knight. This was back when summer blockbuster was a true term. Now, Ricardo, how is this relevant to the conversation? You're just listing off movies released around the same time. Well, I need you to take a look at these movies and see what they have in common. Action blockbusters that are drenched in realism. The Dark Knight is known for its realistic take on the character, some Batman fans not even calling them Batman movies, despite how freaking fantastic they are. Although not as popular of a character as Batman, Iron Man was still a well-known character in the Marvel mythos, and in my humble opinion, is one of the greatest blockbusters of all time, it's just an incredibly fun watch, and I see why audiences fell in love with it. But the film that was squeezed in the middle of these two big movies was none other than Speed Racer. Unlike Iron Man and The Dark Knight and all of the action movies released around this time, Speed Racer diverged anywhere close to the term realistic. It is one of the most trippy, psychedelic, and out-of-the-box movies of all time. Not only does the movie look like this, but it doesn't have a traditional plot structure, it teeters on the line of family-friendly and not, getting pretty violent, and there is a decent amount of cursing in the movie which makes me question its PG rating. Without a doubt, Speed Racer was the odd one out. With the changing movie climate, Speed Racer was never able to capture an audience, being written off by general audiences as well as critics. Nobody understood what this movie was trying to do, but now that we're almost 20 years away from this thing, it seems like just recently, people are starting to see what this movie really is a masterpiece. But why is Speed Racer a masterpiece? Why did it take us 10 minutes to get here? You need to understand the context of this incredibly complex film. I know that might sound crazy because we're talking about a movie called Speed Racer, where the main character is named 
Speed Racer. There's a little monkey walking around in his overalls. It looks like watching NASCAR on acid. But when you sit down and watch the movie for what it is, not just its story, its characters, but for the filmmaking itself, you start to truly appreciate it for what it is. So today, we're going to be taking a look at Speed Racer, the film itself, why I think it's a masterpiece, and why it failed. From the studio intros of Speed Racer, it's very apparent already the kind of film you're going to get, a film with style and color. We see the back of our main character before introduced to a young Speed sitting in school. Something I love about this scene in particular is the frantic editing, and unlike in some movies where the overutilization of cuts is misused, this is very purposeful in matching Speed's emotions. Not really having any interest in school, just having interest in one thing. Your son seems to be interested in only one thing. This is the test he turned in last week. And once when Speed escapes reality, we are introduced to our very first LSD trip. Like, come on, what other movie has this? Pop your things and bring your... to my desk. Speed Racer, slow down! We're then introduced to Rex, Speed's older brother, a very integral character not only in Speed's life and it was really the driving force for his character from this point on, but also for the family at large. After some begging from Speed, Rex eventually takes him to Thunderhead Raceway. This is actually a really good scene and gives a genuine bond between the two characters, which kind of just makes it all more tragic when this happens. I'm joking, of course, that didn't actually happen. But what did happen, though, was this amazing shot. Only in a movie like this could you get cinematography and camera work just like this. A lot of people would levy this being overly CG and not realistic whatsoever, but once again, that's not the movie that Speed Racer is trying to be. Stuff like this, not only stylistically, but realistically, can be achieved inside of a computer. Fun fact, during this scene, the original voice of Speed Racer makes a cameo, so that's kind of cool. During this scene, we flash back to Rex Racer, and oftentimes the complaint that's levied at this film is its weird pacing. The opening of this movie is very evident that this isn't trying to have a normal pace. From the very beginning, we start off at present day with speed, flash back to him as a kid, come back to the modern day, and here we are once again going back to the past. But I think this is done for a plethora of reasons. Not only is it setting up and building upon speed and Rex's relationship, which is a very integral part of this movie, but also it does a great job at symbolizing the path that speed is on in comparison to his brother, almost the exact same. And during this scene, it does a great job at building upon that Rex wasn't this perfect character that he was originally set up to be only a couple minutes prior. It's slowly revealed, which keeps you intrigued. Right when it's about to give you all the juicy details, it cuts back to give you more info on the characters. We're then introduced to Spritel, who is Speed's younger brother and is the worst part of this movie, but we'll dive more into that later, and Trixie, Speed's girlfriend, and we flash back to when they met as kids. I knew it was Ain't no way she just said that. Let me see what this film is rated. Oh, PG. Yeah, punch that <laughs> I told y'all this movie was cool. You get a cute little moment between Speed and Trixie, and then he asks if she wants to see his car collection. Okay, this is my car's collection, and I have uh, his Radiator Springs McQueen. Speed drives up to his house, and we see Rex again, and the question of what really happened to Rex starts to grow. Not really just because you're seeing Rex again, but because there's a f on. What is this family getting into? Then comes one of the most important scenes in the movie. Rex is packing his bags, getting ready to leave the racer house. He passes Speed the keys to the Mach 5 and says that no matter what people might say about him, to never believe him. And while this is a very sweet scene between the two, I would be very sussed out if I was Speed. No one says that if they're not guilty, I'm just saying. John Goodman kind of puts his dick on the table and says, I'm going to give an amazing performance in this movie that's way better than it deserves to be. During a scene where he says that if Rex walks out the door, he's never coming back. While all this might seem like a simple flashback scene to give some context, context and character development, it is way more than that, which we'll get to later in the film. It's then revealed that Rex Racer is considered a dirty driver who took orders from the criminal underworld, and his legacy and reputation is essentially tarnished along with the entire Racer family's name. <laughs> Why do the Wachowskis like seeing kids punch each other so much? And then the bombs officially drop that Rex Racer indeed did pass away. This is also one of my favorite moments of the film. The cinematography and the visuals do a perfect job at displaying the Racer family's trauma and the pain that this causes not only Speed, but the parents. Not a single piece of dialogue comes from one of the Racer family members. It does a perfect job at showing and not telling, which is incredibly important for a moment like this. During this entire scene, Speed is rivaling his older brother's record on the racetrack. He is literally mirroring his older brother, which is shown visually, which I think is really cool symbolism and helps the scene a lot emotionally. Speed eventually lets off the gas to let his older brother keep the record, which I think that one action alone without any words needing to be said helps Speed's character a lot. Folks, I knew Rex Racer, 
And if he's up there somewhere watching this race, you can bet your ass he's damn proud of his little brother. We're then introduced to this mysterious figure, but if you watched any promotion leading up to this film at the time of its release, you know is Racer X. We then cut over to Spritel and Chim Chim watching anime, and this is where I'm kind of forced into talking about the worst aspect of the film like I mentioned earlier. Spritel and Chim Chim feel very shoehorned into this film. I understand they are a classic part of the original anime from back in the day, but the main theme of this movie and the characters you follow usually aren't able to intertwine with the plots of Spritel and Chim Chim all that often, and often takes away from some of the best scenes of the movie, and it honestly feels like the Wachowskis didn't care about this aspect of the movie. Wonder Brothers said, hey, go make a family film that's rated PG, and they ended up making a PG-13 movie, so they had to shoehorn in scenes like this to earn that PG rating. The scene, for instance, still has that speed racer type editing and flair, but still, I feel like you could cut almost all of the solo Spritel and Shim Shim scenes out of the movie, and it wouldn't affect it whatsoever. This is no disrespect to the Spritel actor, I think he's actually very charismatic. It just doesn't really fit in my opinion because the movie's about family trauma and corruption. The reactions from Speed's race from the night prior are coming out, and the conversation around who Speed will sign with in terms of a sponsor is being discussed. But before anything can happen, the house starts shaking. We're then introduced to Royalton, who pulls up in a whole private jet. This can't be legal. And spoiler alert, this is our main villain of the movie, and is one of the greatest villains in movie history. Maybe that's a little bit of a hyperbole, but Roger Allen delivers an absolutely amazing performance. After ordering some pancakes on Uber Eats from IHOP because goddamn this gets me hungry. We learn that Royalton is really trying to schmooze up the Racer family to get Speed to sign with Royalton Industries, along with taking them on his private jet to the headquarters. He's showing them around and... The best drivers must be able to withstand over... Why does he need to eat noodles? I also love how there's just random ass animals in transitions. We're then introduced to Cannonball Taylor, one of the drivers for Royalton and is kinda set up to be this villain character, and he's not a good guy, but he's also not the main villain Royalton is. He's more of a goon than anything. God, that thunder at replay. Nice piece of work. Wow. Is Amir their sexual tension here? After this, Pops drops some anti-capitalist bars. Seriously, this character is amazing. Speed's on the verge of denying Royalton's offer, but before he can get a word out, Royalton stops him. They agree to meet up next week to talk over the deal more. <laughs> what the f***? Did my Apple TV just switch movies? What happened? One second, I gotta check this again. Yep, still PG. We're introduced to another integral character in the film, Taito Tokakan. He's clearly caught up in some bad business with these mobsters, but before he's fed to these piranhas, we get a proper introduction to Racer X. Stuff like this is just what I'm talking about, man. Does this need to be all red? No, but it looks cool. They eventually toss out Taijo and is picked up by Racer X. The only way you'll ever stop these people is to bring them to justice. That's a commodity. I don't waste my money on Get out. We stand a minute with morals. Speed and Trixie are talking about Speed potentially joining Royalton, but before they're about to have car sex, they discover that Spritel's in the trunk just like in the classic show. The more important is the next scene because I personally believe that this is one of the best scenes in the movie. As Speed and Royalton are negotiating a deal, Speed is talking about the importance of racing to him and his family. It provides further context on why all of this means so much to them, and also how this isn't just a sport, it's a religion. Speed eventually turns down Royalton, but then this happens. You poor naive chump. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that load of sickening schmaltz, and I'm gonna give you a bit of an education at the end of it. If you're smart, you'll thank me, and then you'll sign that contract. I'm hard. Roger Allen absolutely mops the floor with his acting performance here, going on one of the most amazing monologues genuinely I have heard in film history. He's explaining how the racing world has been corrupt its entire history, how all these races have been set up and there's no actual winner. The results for these races were long determined before the races ended. I genuinely wish I could just show you the entire clip right here, but I can't do that for obvious copyright reasons. The dialogue, Roger Allen's performance, and Michael Giacchino's score perfectly combine to create an amazing scene. You don't need to have superpowers, you can be an amazing villain if you're just pure evil. Unfortunately, WB had to inject this scene with a few Spritel and Chim Chim moments because you can't have a five minute long straight scene of you talking about stocks and corruption in a movie supposedly intended for eight year olds. To top off the scene, making it even better, you have a transition going straight into the next race. It is so satisfying to watch. This movie is incredible. Are you getting it now? This is the first time we see Racer X actually pop up in a race, and I've always really liked this. He definitely races for the love of it, but I also feel he does it to help speed, which is 
is still really cool. Unfortunately, Racer X's help isn't enough, as Speed eventually crashes because there's a hit that's been put on him by Royalton. Royalton then sues the Racer family in an attempt to discredit their entire company, leaving the family bankrupt and the Racer family essentially no more. With these revelations by Royalton, Speed is obviously distraught. This religion for him has kind of been shifted on its head, leaving him to not know what he's really supposed to do. But then there's this beautiful scene between Speed and his mom, with Susan Sarandon giving an amazing performance. But right after that, Racer X is introduced to Speed's story. Inspector Detector, yes, that's his real name, is attempting to convict Royalton of his fixes and crimes. Taito Tokokan is attempting to help them by giving them the files that'd be able to convict him of such, but in order for them to do that, they would need to enter a race. That being the Cross Country Kazakristo, the same race that killed Rex Racer, Speed's older brother. Pops is immediately against this. He's already lost one son to that race, he's not going to lose another. But Speed and Trixie have other plans, eventually entering the race. They add a bunch of modifications to the Mach 5, which are identical to the gadgets that are in the original series. This whole scene does a really great job at building suspense and showing how dangerous this race is going to be. And yeah, this race is pretty great. It's very classic speed racer, I'd say the most speed racer the entire movie has felt. And while the whole movie is very faithful to the source material, this in particular is very much so, with speed sporting the Mach 5 and his classic look and everything. It's literally just putting the speed racer anime into live action on the big screen, it's amazing. Sprite eventually snitches on speed to Pops, as the race wraps up with Snake Euler winning. Cut to Tejo being a little bitch boy. No, there's lobster there, you could've ate that! And then we actually have a pretty cool scene between Speed and Racer X. I thought we made a good team today. Felt like we've been doing it for a long time. Hey, would you shut the f up? Speed's having a little bit of a game theory about whether Racer X is actually his brother. And, um, yeah, he's right. But before too much can be said, this happens. He's standing like that. A really cool scene between Speed and Pops happens because of the emotional stress that this race has put on their family. Both Emil Hirsch and John Goodwin deliver amazing performances here. Another thing that I like is that even though Pops would rather not be doing this because his son needs him, he immediately helps. I just thought that was a really sweet touch. Pops isn't just a big grump, he does have a heart. But while all this is going on in the middle of the night, Taijo is poisoned by ninjas. Later attempting to also poison Racer X, but it doesn't go so well that time around with this absolutely awesome ninjutsu scene going down. His shot so well and you can see that the Wachowskis really put their Matrix experience to work. After failing on Racer X, he moves over to the Racer family where things also don't go too well for him. Outside of some of the Spritel and Chim Chim scenes, which they are included in this scene as well, it is definitely the most slapsticky. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't like seeing John Goodman spin this guy around in the air like a bow. Was that a ninja? More like a ninja. Taicho is unfit to race as he's ill from the poisoning, but they come up with a solution. We then cut over to the next portion of the race. I feel like I'm saying this about every race, but this has to be one of my favorite races in the movie. This is where the cinematography and editing of Speed Racer really gets to shine, not having any traditional cut whatsoever, going back and forth between each character rather than simple cuts. The monsters are about to perform a hit on Taicho's sister, but little do they know, it's not Taicho's sister, it's Taicho! And he's rocking the fit too! It's revealed that Trixie is actually the one taking place to Taicho in the race, and this is actually really cool. Rather than being a simple love interest or side character, she actually is pretty hands-on in the movie, which is cool to see. <laughs> One of the most badass scenes in the movie, no cap. With Taijo now healthy, he takes his place back as the racer in place of Trixie. And my god, thank you, Wachowskis. The mobsters eventually catch them, but my complaint is, how the heck does Sprite will not have a concussion? And how is Chim Chim not dead? Have you seen the way Speed was driving? They eventually take all of them down, and it's back on the track. But when they get back on the track, they go to the same cave where Rex passed away. I like how they show that Speed's going through a little bit of shock, and gosh, it looks so beautiful beautiful in the cave. The colors of the taillights and headlights absolutely add to the scene. And the way the Wachowski shoot the cars turning makes me feel like this man. And if this movie couldn't have gotten any cooler for you, Speed drives up a freaking mountain. The team eventually wins, which is great, but then there's a little dirty secret revealed. This entire race was done to solely drive up the stock price of Tokakon's company, meaning this wasn't going to help get back at Royalton because Royalton is kind of behind it all. Further driving, you like the pun there, the racing world is corrupted and is always always been. Speed obviously angered by this lets out some emotions at Thunderhead, where Racer X eventually pulls up for one of the most important scenes of the movie. After throwing him around for a little bit, Speed finally asks the question. Why don't you just tell me the truth? You're Rex, aren't you? Uh oh. But then he removes his helmet and... it's not Rex. 
it's the dude from Lost. This is honestly a really good scene between the two. We then have a moment between Speed and Spritel that mirrors when Rex was leaving. When we were talking about that scene earlier and I said it was kind of crucial, I wasn't lying. Pops essentially gets another chance at being able to save one of his sons, letting Speed know that he loves him more than the motor company, something he wasn't able to do with Rex. Not only does this provide so much depth and character development for Pops, but it's just such a great scene between the two characters. But they're interrupted by Dokokan's sister, who gives Speed an invitation to the Grand Prix. Since Taito doesn't plan to attend, and Speed was part of the winning team, he's eligible to compete. The only problem though, they don't have a car. We don't have a car. Barky! Oh, right here, Pops. What are you doing in the kitchen? Same as everyone else. They were eavesdropping listening to their entire conversation. That's a total evasion of privacy. How fast did Royal say he could build that tin can with his fancy machines? 36 hours. And we'll do it in 32. 32 hours? You couldn't pay me to do that. Speed eventually enters the Grand Prix, and there's so much amazing tension that's being built up here. All eyes are on him. This is a very special moment for racing as a whole. He is not supposed to be here. Now stop right there. This is the climax of the movie, this is the final scene. And with that, you usually would have a lot to say and go over and dissect, but I genuinely don't know what to say. In my humble opinion, I think this is one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history, and that is not hyperbole in my opinion. This is a masterclass in direction, cinematography, the screenplay building up to this moment and making you feel that emotion, the visual effects, oh my god, the visual effects. Everything here is amazing, it's satisfying, the camera work from the Machowskis on every turn. They aren't trying to shoot a movie, they're trying to paint a picture. Every time that I watch this movie and this scene comes on, or I watch this scene, alone, I always end up crying. Now once again, when it comes to movies, I cry a lot, but not usually after first viewing. The fact they're able to get this out of me time after time of watching this for over 10 years now is just incredible. This is what film should be, bringing an emotion out of you without even needing to say anything. This is art, this is cinema, and this is... But why did it fail? As we alluded to earlier on in the video, this film was up against tough competition and did not fare well at the box office. In fact, this movie lost Warner Bros. over $100 million and it was one of its worst flops in history. With a budget of $120 million and a 93.9 box office, obviously, the movie lost a bunch of money. But it doesn't end there because this movie had an over $80 million marketing campaign, damn near the amount of the actual film, which essentially puts this as a $200 million dollar movie. They had global tie-ins with companies like General Mills, McDonald's, Hot Wheels, Lego, and Target. Warner Brothers was clearly expecting for this to be a massive franchise for them, but it's believed that because of the marketing blitz of this movie, it actually turned off audiences from going to see it. It was constant, it was everywhere, and it got to me too. But I think there are a couple more reasons why it didn't catch on. First, this was heavily promoted as from the directors of The Matrix, and I don't think parents would want to take their kids to a movie that's heavily promoted to be from the same people who made The Matrix. Secondly, the movie did not have a good critical response, and when people look at that, they're like, well, I'm not gonna go spend my money on a movie that's not good. But I think all of these reasons why the movie failed combine for one major reason. People were not ready. Speed Racer was a film, and to this day I still believe, is a film far ahead of its time. The cinema landscape was shifting into a realm of realism in cinematic universes. Critics and audiences were not ready for a film that was so in your face with its visuals and non-traditional structured storytelling. Speed Racer's entire purpose is to be different, to push the boundaries and change the perception of what a kid's movie can be. But that might also be part of it. Speed Racer isn't really a kid's movie. Speed Racer is just trying to be a good movie. I have no idea whether Speed Racer would have done better back then or if it would have done better if it released nowadays. Because back then the cinematic universe and the realism was just getting started and now it seems like every movie nowadays is immersed in it. Marvel is now the biggest franchise in the world and it's kind of killed movies like Speed Racer. You will never see another movie like this again and that just kind of sucks to say. I genuinely don't know what else Warner Brothers could have done to make this movie do better. It was one of their biggest marketing campaigns of all time. They wanted this to be a new franchise for them. There was a TV show running alongside of this thing, there was so much merchandise everywhere, and it crashed and burned. And I believe as a result of this, so did the rest of the Speed Racer franchise as a whole. For almost 15 years now, the Speed Racer franchise has been dormant, finishing out that aforementioned TV show and not really having a lot of anything since. It felt like everybody gave up on Speed Racer, he was a relic of his time, and he should never be touched again. But 
you guys can thank me because I manifested a brand new live action Speed Racer series heading to Apple TV+. Plus. I am literally not joking, while I was in the making of this video, a brand new live action Speed Racer series was announced and I could not be happier. Will this be Speed Racer 2008? Will this be a follow up? Absolutely not. Do I wish that written sequel strip was made? Absolutely. I would have loved that more than anything, but I'm just happy to see that this character that I've loved my entire life be given another shot. So a new generation will be able to grow up with Speed Racer. I'll always be able to look back at the Wachowski's 2008 Speed Racer as one of the greatest movies of all time. I